This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. I'm Nick Ravellis, the host of UCSD TV's Opera Talk and the Geisel Director of Education and Outreach for San Diego Opera. My passion is helping people understand opera and come to love it as much as I do. I invite the principal artistic team for each production here to the Beverly Sills Salon for a freewheeling discussion before a live audience that covers everything from the music to the motivations of the characters to the director's stage vision and sometimes even a penetrating look at a singer's career. There is never a dull moment and it's one of the joys of my job that I get to moderate these discussions. I think you'll enjoy it too. Welcome to our first Stars on the Salon event, our Artists' Roundtable. Uh, this time, of course, on our production of Turandot, a wonderful production designed by the great uh, contemporary British artist. I guess we can also call him American because he lived for such a long time in Los Angeles, David Hockney. A terrific production that I know that w many of you are familiar with, but I'm delighted to see again because I think it's one of the most musical of productions in terms of the set uh, really connecting with what's going on, not only in the story, but in the music and an understanding of what Puccini did in this score to tell the story. Um, let me introduce our panel first of all, beginning uh, immediately at my right, singing the role of Turandot, a soprano who is making her San Diego opera debut with us, uh, Lisa Lindstrom. <laughs> she very excitingly made her Met debut in this role uh, in 2009, mm -hmm. is that correct? And uh, so um, we'll ask her a little bit about that as well. Uh, next to her, our Kalaf returning uh, for the fourth time. <laughs> I got it right. For the fourth time, he was here originally in uh, Simon Bocanegro, where he sang the role of Gabriele. He was here as Pinkerton um, and uh, as Radames, and now singing the role of Kalaf, tenor Carlo Ventre. <laughs> singing the role of Liu, and there's a story here, because you all, if you were at the first night, if you were at the prima of... Maria Stuarda, you heard this wonderful soprano step in uh, because the, uh, the original singer who was contracted to do Maria was not able to sing that night. She was ill, and this wonderful singer just happened to be in the United States, just happened to be free that evening, and just happened to know the role of Maria Stuarda. Now, that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, the soprano, of course, and now back to sing an entire role in all of the performances of it, the, of Liu, uh, Hermonella Yaho. <laughs> Next to her, playing the role of the blind king, Timur, who is, of course, the father of the prince, Kalaf. <laughs> And he's been here so many times, I can't, I can't even tell you the, the number of roles. Seven times. Zeben, is that all? Yes. Okay. Unfortunately, yes. So, well, we'll, we'll work on that. Uh, is, of course, the bass, Reinhard Hagen. Welcome back. <laughs> and uh, singing the role of Pong, next to him, of course, is tenor Joseph Hu, who has been here many times. Singing the role of Pang, tenor Joel Sorensen. And singing the role of Ping, Jeff Matsy, baritone. And all three of those gentlemen, of course, have been here a number of times. So um, we're delighted to welcome them all back. Now, I'm going to start with the hardest question first. And this is open to all of you. We know that Turandot is something of a fable. It's a, a, a fairy tale, really. So we know what it's about on the surface. 
we know essentially the, the outline of the story of this, this princess, uh, this uh, princess of ice, who has decided uh, to uh, seek revenge for the horrible death and murder of an ancient ancestor, the Princess Lu Ling. And uh, in order to uh, keep her vow, she has sworn never to marry, never to have anything to do with a man. And of course, one royal prince after another comes from all over the world seeking her hand in marriage. In order to keep them at bay, she has three riddles that they have to uh, answer. And if they don't answer the riddles correctly, they're beheaded. Very interesting story. So we know what the story is about on the surface. But I want to ask all of you, and any of you can chime in on this, what is Turandot really about? If we get this question wrong, are you going to yeah. cut off our heads? <laughs> just before, I, I just want to make that clear before. I, I don't want my head cut off. But no. I think no. it's about, it's really about love. I mean, that's what Turandot is really about, and finding the love and what it is that you truly desire as opposed to what you don't desire. Mm -hmm. Anyone else like to weigh in on, on that? Joel, I know you're, you're dying to say something. <laughs> well, there's this minister named Pang, and... Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not <laughs> You see why I thought it would be fun to have Ping, Pang, and Pong here. I don't think we've ever had all three of them at a tour and dot, uh, uh, artist roundtable. I just thought that it'd be kind of fun to, to hear what you guys actually have to say about the, the rest of the opera. Uh, you certainly have a lot to say in the opera. We're the best part. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, what, okay. what, is, what is the story actually? Is it an allegory? Um, if, it's, if it's about love, what kind of love does it reflect? Lisa? Well, I, I do think it's about love, and I think it's about true love. I think it's about the kind of love that is pure, courageous, and honest, and the kind of love that actually Liu depicts by sacrificing herself. And I think that's the lesson that Torandot learns is um, through Liu, and also the courage of the prince, mm -hmm. the stranger. Because the prince, I think, reflects that pure love. He really, he absolutely is smitten with her the moment he meets her. Is that right, Carlo? Yes. Um, there is a phrase in the last act that I like very much, because for me it's very clear. When uh, Calaf sing, the call your is life. In fact, after this phrase, there is a, a big kiss between Calaf and uh, Turandot. And she's a, a child. And after this kiss, the real Turandot comes out. She becomes a woman. Yes. She's no longer a child. She becomes a woman. Um, Reinhardt, from your, from your vo viewpoint, uh, as Timur, what do you think the, 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 uh, the opera is really about? That's really difficult to answer. <laughs> I would say um, it's about humanity mm -hmm. in general. It's not only love, it's more, actually but I don't know the rights, right words to, to say that in English, if I'm honest. <laughs> but humanity, and the, and the best and the worst, I suppose, mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of humanity. Hmm? Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about Liu with Hermonella, because I think Liu is, um, is the character that Puccini had the most trouble with. He, um, um, once she makes her sacrifice, I'd, I'm not entirely sure that he quite knew what to do after, after that, and he really struggled 
with this character. It's also one of the characters, she's also one of the characters that doesn't show up in any of the original sources. She's not in the Gozzi play. Uh, I don't think she's in the Schiller play. How do you see the character of, of Liu? How do you understand her? But for me, you know, as uh, my colleagues told before, it's about the true love. And um, this kind of virtue comes from, uh, from Liu, especially. Why? Because in the beginning, she, she felt in love just with a smile that uh, she, she uh, Kalaf gave to her. And for her, it was the whole of her life, you know, building, uh, building on this, this smile, this kind of sincerity. She was, you know, she is happy with that, and she lives with that. Another thing, I th it's, uh, you know, the generosity of this character, you know, taking care of his father. Mm -hmm. Being, you know, because, uh, because uh, his father is blind, and she's, you know, in somehow the eyes, the guide of uh, his father. Another thing, um, the sacrifices that she makes, you know, for his, her life, lo love, it's, you know, giving herself, killing herself, because she doesn't want, you know, to lose in somehow, you know, mm -hmm. even if she, she lost his lo uh, her lo uh, love also. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, she's, you know, so pure, so honest, so simple, um, a great generosity, and I think maybe it's a little perfect, if we have to say, for the reality that we live. But is, uh, in the opera, like in, in the theater, everything is so loud, because it's not just for the people, you know, uh, for the, the, um, it's for everybody. It doesn't mean, you know, for the pu uh, poor people or rich people. We are everybody, we are human beings, so everybody, you know, knows and uh, knows about sacrifices, about love, about everything. So in this big, big, you know, figure about uh, the love, which uh, Puccini describes so beautifully, you know, the figure of uh, Liu, it's, you know, maybe the allegory, I have mm -hmm. to say, about how the true love has to be. And maybe we developed a little bit too much, you know, in our days, because we lost a lot about, you know, that everything is so material and uh, being in you know, a human beings, you know, we have to enjoy the, the simple things every day, as a love or sacrifice or the smile or something, you know, which makes our life, you know, more interesting. I think that really is one of the most touching things about the opera is in her aria, she says that she's fallen in love essentially with Kalaf because he smiled at her. That's, and that's, that's it. all it is, yep. you know. Absolutely. And I can just imagine that, you know, the, she was walking in the palace somewhere with the father leading him along and then she sees this man and he smiles and that's it, you know, and she just dedicates herself uh, to him, True. which makes the sacrifice even more uh, exactly. important. Um, I want to return to Ping, Pang and Pong just for a moment. Joseph, um, uh, it seems to me that Puccini does something that a lot of composers do that I think is really wonderful, is that he creates a different musical world for, for each character in the opera. Um, I, the, the, the biggest difference, I think, is the music of Turandot as opposed to the music of Liu. Mm -hmm. they're, they're very different musical languages in a way. But there's also a sort of a different spirit uh, about the music of Ping, Pang, and Pong. Can you describe it for us, what that music is like and what the challenges are of singing well, first of all, I have to say I love this character because Pong is actually from Zhejiang, which is the province uh, very close to Taiwan and, and those area. But both my parents are from that province. Mm -hmm. So when I say I would like to go back to Qiang, it's a real feeling from my heart. Mm -hmm. And I actually went back to the province a couple, five years ago with my father once. Mm -hmm. It's a, quite a beautiful place. Uh, about this opera, I do have something to say, s since I probably the only authentic one in this whole cast. <laughs> 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 what? You don't look like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, the opera is a makeup story. We all know that, and the history of uh, where Puccini get those uh, information. It's very interesting, because the location is Forbidden City, but the, the princess who got uh, kidnapped 
is happened in Song Dynasty, which is around 15th century. So at that time, there's no forbidden city, just to let you know, mm. for your information. Mm. And the, the music, uh, Puccini picked up about like eight different melodies from, from Chinese folk songs and, and put into this opera and make it really splendid and beautiful. Uh, but the opera, the structure of the opera is a mixture of the Beijing opera and the, the Western music. Because the Ping Pen Pong is more like a, a, a character in the Beijing opera who is actually telling the story, which is very important. And also do a lot of uh, improvise, improvisation in the opera. And also the uh, the the, the riddles part, we do have that tradition, but never have anybody got a head cut off. Okay? <laughs> it's during the new year, I think it's uh, 15 uh, days, uh, January 15th, which is Lenten's festival. And during that period of time, a lot of uh, girls who want to get married, uh, they give the riddles to the, the, the man, and if whoever can answer those three riddles will can marry the, the, the girl. So that there's, they do have this tradition mm. in China. Uh, so th I think this is a lot of a different culture and music, everything mixed together, but make actually the, the whole thing very splendid. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, you know, the, even Chinese people in China right now, they are very proud of this music and they perform this very often in, the, in, in Forbidden City. They That's what I was going to ask you. Uh, how is Turandot accepted in China uh, today? Well, it's a wonderful opera. For me, I, I never think, well, for example, like, da, 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 di, da, 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 da. That's the folk song. When I was little, I sing, It's talking about how beautiful the lily is. It's a, such a beautiful flower. We're just talking about flowers. But Puccini took that and made such a wonderful in many, many places in this opera. So I think, well, Chinese people love it. The more, the better. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know the whole song in yes, Mandarin? I do. You want to sing it for us? Uh, <laughs> Fanfangia <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. I put you on the spot. I'm sorry, Joseph. You can, you can, uh, I'll take you to dinner. Thanks. <laughs> but that's beautiful. Um, let's turn to our Turandot. Um, one of the most exciting things, I'm sure, is for a person to make a Metropolitan Opera debut. I imagine it's even more exciting to make a Metropolitan Opera debut on two hours' notice, which is what happened to Lisa not terribly long ago. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about that? That's, that's a very exciting story. Well, I was, uh, it was a very exciting, beyond exciting experience. Uh, I was hired by the Metropolitan Opera to sing the role of Turandot uh, in the 2009-2010 season. And I was engaged to cover all of the performances except for four, which I, I was assigned to be the performer in. And that meant that I was the cover for the opening night of the season, of the Turandot performing season. And, um, you know, it's, ex it's an exciting time for all of us when, as we build up to opening night, much like this time is for us right now because we're building up to our opening night. And we have rehearsals and we're moving from the rehearsal space into the stage and we get to experience the whole new world in this fantastic at the Met, it's this other fantastic set, this Franco Zeffirelli set, which is amazing. Opulent doesn't really even give it its due. 
So it was an exciting week for me, no matter what. Um, and the soprano that was engaged to sing that first evening had been struggling with some health issues and really doing her very, very best to get going. And the day before the opening, the Met called and said, you know, we think she's fine, but just don't go out partying tonight. <laughs> and I said, darn, I was really <laughs> thinking about that. And uh, then the next day they called and said, everything is great. Just relax. Thank you for being on standby, but we're fine. And I thought, oh, <laughs> thank goodness. Because as the cover soprano, we never, or I should say very rarely, get to actually be on stage. The main cast gets stage rehearsal time, orchestra rehearsal time, but the cover cast just doesn't because there isn't time, there isn't money, there isn't space for all of this to happen with so many people. So I thought, good, I'm not going to have to learn all of this on my feet. I'll get a little bit of time to get broken into it. Well, um, Fast forward through the day, it's opening night, and I went to dinner with my father and my stepmother and finished eating dinner at about, I guess it was about 5.15, no, 6.15, 6.15. And the curtain was at eight o'clock, and my phone rang, mm. and it was the Metropolitan Opera saying, Ms. Lindstrom, how are you feeling this evening? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, fine. <laughs> And uh, then she said, would you like to make your Metropolitan Opera debut tonight? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, I want to do that. <laughs> and so I hurried and got to the theater as quickly as I could. Uh, the first appearance for Princess Turandot in the opera of Turandot is as the executioner, basically, for the Prince of Persia. It's not a very exciting moment. It's sort of sad, in fact. But that was my first time on the stage, and everybody was standing by to help me get from point A to point B to point C, and I got in my costume very quickly, I got in my wig and my makeup very quickly, and the conductor knocked on my door and he said, are we okay? And I said, <laughs> yeah, we're great. <laughs> And he said, okay, I'll see you out there. And um, I eventually went out on stage for the first time ever at the beginning of my scene in act two, scene two, to sing In Questa Reggia. And I walked out on stage and thought, geez, this place is huge. I hope I don't fall down. I hope I remember my words. I can't even see the conductor. <laughs> Where is he? Okay, well, all of that has to go out of your mind, and you just, you just do your job. And mm -hmm. I did. It was the most magical, amazing evening of my life <laughs> thus far, and um, happily a great success. Yeah, yeah, really. And now, of course, you've been singing Turandot just about everywhere. And the exciting thing, too, is that you're going to be doing it at La Scala. Yes. Uh, and not, uh, and not terribly long from now. Kalaf, let's talk about the vocal challenges uh, of this role. Now, you, you have to sing in, at the beginning of Act Three, the most well-known tenor aria ever. I mean, I think it has surpassed um, <coughs> Uh, so many other, La Donna Mobile, for instance, and, and so many other tenor arias because uh, it has become the international anthem of soccer or football. <laughs> so, you know, the whole world knows this aria. What is it like <laughs> to, to step out at the beginning of Act Three and have to sing it? Well, in talking musical, I prefer the first one. Non piangere Non piangere you. Oh. It's so because beautiful. Because writing music is more rich and articulate than Nessun Dorma. But Nessun Dorma is the most famous, actually, area yeah. in, the, in the world. Yeah. It's so difficult because you start Nessun Dorma after seeing two acts. Very difficult. And singing a lot in yes, those two acts. Yes. So you're, you're not very fresh. Yes. You have the, and that's the probably the biggest challenge. 
who sing from the top to the end in mm -hmm. the soprano. Mm -hmm. So how do you get your energy up <laughs> during that intermission between act two and act three? I never lost my energy during the performances. <laughs> never. <laughs> <laughs> That's what singing is about, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, you have to be there. Yeah. I need this energy to communicate with the audience. Mm -hmm. Also when I don't sing. Mm -hmm. uh, Timur, Reinhardt, let's talk about the challenges of your role, one of which is, of course, you have to pretend like you're blind through the entire thing. But also, vocally, um, you don't have an aria. Is this disappointing for you? This is actually, yeah, of course it's disappointing <laughs> not having an aria, but I have to say it's much more difficult to sing a role with a couple of sentences than to sing a big role, because if you are making mistakes, you never can take it back. So as big as the role is, as uh, less doesn't matter if you do some mistakes. In this, ki uh, in this uh, role, it's not possible. And also the challenge is it's um, all about feeling. And you have pretty much to deliver the feelings in your body. It's, it's uh, more, than, more that than singing. Mm -hmm. And I like that, if I'm honest. But mm -hmm. the most challenging thing on this, I have to tell, is the second act for me. In the second act, I, I don't sing a single word. But I have to be on stage for half an hour and acting, looking very important and mm. reacting because I cannot see anything. I have to, to try, I have to say, because it's always possible to develop that. I'm on my way. But to act with your body language, just hearing something, just reacting on the words from the others, which is not easy, I can tell you. I never thought about that, but that's absolutely true. He has nothing, not even in the ensemble. No. Nothing. No. So, now, th now that, is the, that is the actor's challenge, to react. Definitely, yeah. Without words, right? Uh, without, uh, without song. Yeah, and also to use this wonderful word, uh, which is, I, I don't know if there's any word in English which, which matches this one, it's in German, it's schmalzig. It's really like, <laughs> like well, I don't, I don't even know how to explain that, but Lotvi, of course, he said that, don't make it schmaltzig. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you shouldn't over, overact and not doing to less, uh, not, uh, yeah, not, yeah, not doing um, less, yeah, because uh, you will be lost. Mm -hmm. You're just one, okay, like, oh, who's that column with this big stick on the stage? <laughs> Never <laughs> moving. Shouldn't be like that as well, so. It's difficult. Yeah. Uh, Puccini once said that art is a kind of <coughs> art is a kind of illness. What do you think Puccini meant by this? That that art is a kind of disease. Is that something that that uh, rings a bell with with any of you? <laughs> <laughs> it's more like an insanity. <laughs> Do you think that's what he meant? That it was like an insanity? I, I, I wonder, um, uh, well, because I cannot find the context uh -huh. of what he said. I just, but it, it is one of his famous quotes, is that art is like an illness. I think, uh, well, I, I don't know, Joel. G.B. Lamperti, great teacher. Um, I think roughly, well, not, not necessarily, contem not, not contemporary, but Lamperti said of, of singing, if you can live without it, live without it. So, I mean, I think there's another indication. It, it's, you, you, your whole life is, you take just, you have to take just about everything on faith because you, you start out, you have no idea if you're ever gonna succeed. Um, you know, you used to say, don't, don't count on the job until you have the contract. Well, now anymore, it's don't count on the job until the check is cleared. <laughs> um, especially in this day and age where work is, is you know, pr it's pretty hard right now. So mm -hmm. you, you're, you're living your whole life on, on faith in, a, in a, a, a difficult business that you might wish on your worst enemy, maybe, mm -hmm. um, but you don't necessarily want your children to follow in your footsteps. Um, so 
yeah, it's, it's an illness. <laughs> you got to be a really sick individual <laughs> to do this. <laughs> so, um, no, I mean, we love what we do or we wouldn't do it because yeah. it's, as I said, I think last year, I love what I do, but getting from point A to point B is, is sometimes excruciatingly difficult uh, mentally, psychologically, emotionally, financially, spiritually, any Lee that you like, mm -hmm. um, as many Lees as an attorney's <laughs> phone book. Um, but but uh, no, I mean, so, so I understand that, that line. And, and Reinhardt now knows what it's like to be a character tenor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's stay at that end of the table for just a minute. Um, the three of you sing together much of the time. Um, I'm sure that that uh, uh, creates its own challenges, does it not, Jeff? Well, more for these two, because they, <laughs> they do, you know, pang and pong, and they switch back and forth. Uh, each have, has done each other's role. So as you're getting into the middle of the trios, trying to remember who sings what, do I go up, do I go down, who sings the <laughs> harmony part here, who does that, that they have to solve that. Um, the only thing I have similar to that is in Bohem, if you do Schonard and Marcello in the first act, the rest of it is okay. But these guys, it's more intricate. And it's, we finish each other, other's sentence quite often. And right. it helps knowing that I've, I've known Joseph for a while, I've known Joel for, for much longer. Um, and we've worked together, so we sort of know each other, and we know how each other works, so we, we're able to think off of each other. And, and the, the relationship we have off stage helps come into play on stage, I hope. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel Yeah, like yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's great to do, I mean, this, we, this is the first time we've done tour and First time we've done tour and um, But it, we did lots of magic flutes and a bunch of other things, so that was fun. Um, just to clarify the record, uh, Joseph has not sung Pond. Oh, sorry. And sorry. may he never have to, because <laughs> I, I've sung, until this, until here, I have always sung Pong, and to sing Pong has been, um, well, you go through these little mental aneurysms because <laughs> you're, you're going along. The, the, the difficulty is that you sing in unison for about three pages, and then you have two notes that are different, and then you go back to unison for several pages. The solo lines are easy because you just have to remember the sequences, but it's, it's the, the, the ensemble stuff because Puccini, he, he, must have, he hated somebody because you, <laughs> you, you're going along, and it's literally just two or three notes that are different for a measure, and then you're back into unison. And I remember the first time that I did Torendot back at City Opera, I was covering with John Langston, a, a wonderful performer. I mean, and John is the same, same situation. John had always done uh, Pong, and now he's doing Pang, and we're in rehearsals. And John, who, I mean, the consummate professional, would just stop dead in his feet and close his eyes and grip his head because <laughs> he'd done it so much that it was so in his body that he just, his brain would stop. And I've had a couple of those moments and it's, it's like, <laughs> so, but this, the, the, the music, I, you know, uh, act one, act two, scene one, if I may say so, and I will, um, is quite possibly the most beautiful music that Puccini ever wrote. Mm -hmm. It is the, the, the on a casa nel onan section is just so beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's why I said, we're the best part. <laughs> because it's just, it's some of the most beautiful music that he ever wrote. And it, it's worth the price of admission right there. And, and you hope, or one hopes, I hope, that when you sing that section, you, you do service to that music because it is so incredibly beautiful. It, it really is yeah. exquisite. That is just a gorgeous, gorgeous scene. I've heard so many people throughout my life say, oh, I wish we, they could just get rid of ping, pang, and pong because they find it boring. And I've, I've heard that so many times through my life. And then when I really got to know Turandot, I thought, what are they talking about? This is the most mm -hmm. glorious music. It's just beautiful. Um, one more thing, I, um, we, we can't, um, I think talk about Turandot without talking about the Mount Everest of Italian dramatic arias for soprano, and that is in Questo Reggia. Um, talk to us a little bit about this aria. It's um, um, why, why is it challenging? What 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 are the vocal challenges in that particular moment, um, beginning from having to sing it cold to you know the last the last phrases where you're trading. Um, music with for trading phrases with with Kalaf. Well, like, like Carlo said, 
I've been backstage largely all night, getting usually getting dressed because it usually takes that long to get me all put together. <laughs> um, and he's been singing the whole time, and the entire opera kind of after this beautiful scene with ping pong pong, the the entire thing sort of grinds to a halt when I get out there, and it is somewhat daunting to start your singing evening with an aria like In Questa Regia because it's so declamatory. And, but it is the dichotomy of the character Turandot, which is to find the softness within the declamation. In other words, how to portray this woman who is always called the ice princess as a woman, as a flesh and blood human being. So thankfully, that challenge is usually challenging enough to occupy all of my thoughts mm -hmm. that I don't spend too, too much time thinking, gulp, here I am. <laughs> They're all waiting. <laughs> um, but the big challenges obviously are that it's a declamatory, a largely declamatory aria, which requires a certain color and um, presence of tone at the onset, there's no easing into the role of Torondot. Mm. You just go out there and you gotta, gotta nail it. And, and as Ava Turner says so simply, you need projection, dear. <laughs> I watched that today, too. Yeah, she, she says these beautiful, well, one must project. <laughs> and I thought, well, yeah. <laughs> she puts it so simply. She does. Well, I found it interesting, too, that one of the words that she uses is Annunciation that she picks it, you know, as one of the requirements for the role, as if that wouldn't be part of any role. But then I thought, well, uh, is that a particular requirement of of this particular of, of this role or of in questa regia? Do you find that you need to articulate this more than, let's say, visitarte, you know, by the same composer from Tosca or 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 something else? I don't know. Actually, I caught that also. I wondered why she used that word. Um, I can see why, because her uh, her initial uh, monologue, Torondot's monologue, is the story of Lo Ling. It is about the grido, this this scream of fear and the fact that she lost her life at the hands of a stranger who took her entire everything mm -hmm. kingdom and and um, yes I mean if you say the word grido you're going to really say it you're not just gonna say grido mm -hmm. so maybe that's what she was talking about I don't know yeah that's certainly uh, the way I approach it so um, let's take some questions from the audience I'm sure that there are some questions out there Does anybody have any questions for our, our panel? Yeah. A silly question. It's for Carlos. There are no silly questions. Yeah. When you talked about doing Pinkerton, you said you didn't like the character. Are you happier with Kevin? Are you Cal happy? Character? Yeah. I love this role. Okay. Yes, because when I think about uh, Calaf, I have three concepts. Love, generosity, and great human humanity and sensibility. I love this character. It might be interesting to hear from Joseph about his background in San Diego. Well, that's true. Joseph, um, actually, of, of this panel, Joseph is the only one who came through our uh, San Diego Opera Ensemble, which was a, a young artist program. Yeah, tell us a little bit about, about uh, uh, your background, Joseph. Well, uh, I got my degree in library science when I was in Taiwan. My father would not let me study music, so I came to the United States to study information science and music degree at the same time, so my, my father allowed me. And after I study, I've been to a couple program, and I think in 1994, 94, 93 or 94, uh, Dottie Randall introduced me to send a tape to San Diego Opera. So I started, and um, Mr. Campbell kind enough to take me in as a young artist, and, and I, I did my uh, 
debut as Arturo in Lucia di la Memore. And since then, I think I've behaved pretty well. So <laughs> in Capo <laughs> hire me frequently back to this company and this has become my favorite company. Other questions? Um, I wonder um, where, where you folks are going next. I, I always find it interesting to know, you know, what's next for you in your career. Let's start with, with uh, at the end of the table with Jeff. Well, right after this, I have uh, one day off to fly back to New York and we start <coughs> rehearsals at the Met for Romeo and Juliet. I'm singing the role of Paris this time around in that. Um, and then after that, I go on, I'm going to go on tour with them to Japan. Oh, great. So I get to go home. Joel. Um, I have several weeks off. My wife will put me to work. <laughs> and then I come back here for Falsaki in Rosencavalier. And then I go to San Francisco and will be covering and rehearsing Loge in Das Rheingold and Mime in Siegfried for their ring cycle this summer. Great. Joseph? I will go back home too, but I will back for the Carmen for the end of the season for San Diego Opera. Leonard. Before I answer what I will do, I will answer what I could have done after <laughs> this. I could have come back. I had this generous uh, um, invitation to sing Baron Ox in Rosenkavalier, but unfortunately, I didn't study that. Not yet, and so that was definitely not enough time to study this huge role, but thank you again, Ian, mm -hmm. to invite me here. And uh, well, I, instead I, uh, of that, I will go back uh, to Berlin singing um, the uh, Les Troyens, and uh, after that, with the Berlin Philharmonic's uh, first Nazarene in Salome. Ermonella. <laughs> After Liu, I'm going to make my debut as Louisa Miller in France, Lyon, and after the different Traviatas, Violetta in Common Garden, uh, Germany, Arena di Verona in Italy. I'll make my debut in uh, Barcelona as Marguerite in Faust, and so go on. <laughs> Great. Carlo. Oh, okay. After here, I go to Berlin with uh, Lisa to sing the last performance. Germania from Franchetti, and then go to London to sing Aida, Covent Garden, uh, Opera La Bastiglia Tosca, uh, Munich uh, Aida, Orange Aida, <laughs> Arena di Verona Aida, <laughs> and finally, <laughs> Holidays. <laughs> and Lisa. Uh, I get to go back to Berlin and sing uh, with Carlo, Germania by Franchetti. Uh, after that, La Scala. After that, Holiday. No, Berlino. Yeah, Berlin again, Turandot. Then Holiday. Then another Turandot. Then another Turandot. <laughs> then another Turandot. <laughs> and then Zalome. San Diego Opera. That's right, Aww. yes. Uh, Lisa will be opening our season next year in Salome, which is very, very exciting. I want to thank all of you for being with us and being so generous with your time. Uh, thank you, and I know that all of us are really looking forward to a splendid uh, performance of Turandot. Thank you. Thank you.